friends, welcome back to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am talking about a hot topic that literally um, we get questions about every single day. I talk about it a lot, and so I figured I would just revisit it and offer what we do and how we do it and hoping that it will help you out. And what are we talking about? Helping our flowers last longer. Whether you are a home gardener that is bringing flowers into your home, or if you are a commercial cut flower grower, um, whether you're selling to florists or going to supermarkets or going to farmer's markets or a farm stand, um, I'm going to kind of go down each one of those little rabbit holes. But before we get started, if you're new here, welcome aboard. So glad you have come to um, kind of have a little sampling of what we're all about. And if you want to learn more about the work that the Gardener's Workshop is doing, head on over to thegardenersworkshop.com where you will find so many resources um, on growing cut flowers, just gardening in general, seed starting, um, the tools that I use to maintain our garden, the supplies you hear me talk about. That's kind of our thing, y'all, is that we don't just offer every new thing that comes down the pike, much to many salesmen's dismay, I might add. We just simply sell those things that I use here on the farm that I find to be really useful. And um, the same seeds that I plant, we don't save seed. We buy seed through seed houses and hybridizers, package them with the same instructions that I follow, and offer them to you. And that's kind of our niche, y'all. And then, of course, we have our online courses um, from On Demand, short courses that you can buy anytime right up to our flower-based business courses that are typically only um, offered once a year for, for enrollment for one short period of time from my basics flower farming school to Dave Dowling's school on growing bulbs, perennials, and woodies to the hoop and greenhouse course with Steve and Gretel of um, Sunny Meadows, um, to our farmer florist school, and even our florist school that helps those flower professionals that want to learn how to purchase and use locally grown flowers. Friends, there is so much over at the Gardener's Workshop. I just encourage you to go over there and check it out. And all of that is what makes it possible for me to bring to you so much wonderful content. And we appreciate it when you need something or you need to scale, expand your knowledge to visit us. We appreciate that when that time comes. So friends, today we are talking about helping your flowers last longer. And there are so many pieces to this puzzle, y'all. Um, and what I want to say is, that each one of these little pieces that you decide to incorporate into your cycle just helps your flowers last a little bit longer. There is no one step that makes it all better. It's doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that that just makes your flowers last longer. Now, making your flowers last a long time may not be super important to you if you're a home gardener and you've got a yard full of flowers to cut, but if you are a flower enthusiast, I mean, I'm thinking of people like um, folks that want to share flowers from their garden. I'm thinking of people that are growing flowers because they are doing the flowers for their church flowers each week. Um, I'm thinking of flower farmers, of course, because we have the most invested in making our flowers last longer, right? So what I want to say is there is no one special bullet. There is just lots of little steps and practices that you can incorporate that each one just gives you a little 
bit more time. It adds another day here, another day there by what you're going to talk about. So um, there's a few golden rules that I want to talk about first that no matter what your end result is, meaning if you're a home gardener or a flower farmer, that we should all, you know, work towards incorporating into our step. And um, first and foremost is you have to harvest the flowers at the right stage, friends. You know, I mean, I think this is a step that so many people don't, don't even realize is so significant. And so, you know, we're not going to talk about it today, but every flower, every different flower has the best stage to harvest in. And they're usually different or they vary from flower to flower. There are those flowers that the minute you cut them, they, they do not develop another iota. They just, you're, you're, you're stopping them in time when you cut them. I'm thinking of zinnias. I'm thinking of coxcomb. Those are flowers that just, when you cut them, you get what it is, what you get. That's the end of the story. So you have to cut them at the right stage for the best display, as well as that they're mature enough to have a strong neck. Then there's other flowers, um, which I think many of them fall into, is that when you cut them, they continue to develop after you make the cut. And that is such a gift, y'all. Do you realize that means that if we cut them early and that stage, we can get them indoors so they're not out there suffering in the heat and the humidity, the bug pressure, the um, wind. Um, so I'm thinking of things like sunflowers, snapdragons, all of those. You can cut them early in their stage and get them indoors to protect them, and they still continue to develop. So you do have to learn for every different flower that you're growing, what is the best stage? That is step number one. There is nothing you can do at, if you cut it at the wrong time to make that flower better. I often think of, I can remember somebody telling me, um, I was learning about canning um, vegetables, which we have always done a lot of. It's like, do not vegetable, do not can a bunch of old vegetables. If you leave them too long on the plant and then do a big harvest and bring it in and they're old, Don't think canning's going to make them better because it's not. It's the same thing with cut flowers. Cutting an old flower, there is nothing you can do to make it young again, okay? So that's step number one, harvest at the right stage. And another part of that practice is do not harvest wet flowers, if at all possible. I know as a flower farmer, through the past two decades of me growing commercially, I have definitely cut wet flowers when we had to. It is not the best case. Um, And then you have to go through steps to dry them. We do not use fans. Um, We set them out on an open air carport where they're protected from the sun, where they are just naturally drying just like they would in the garden. Um, But that's, you know, the best case is to not have to cut them wet. Um, And that's why as a flower farmer, you have to keep your eye to the sky and to your phone app on weather. And that means is sometimes for me, if we, let's just say, harvest on a Thursday morning, and now it's looking like it's likely it's going to be raining on Thursday morning, guess who's out in the garden on Wednesday evening cutting like a wild woman, typically by herself, because I don't have staff then, trying to get as much cut as possible, particularly of the most vulnerable flowers. So, Um, That's step number one, getting them at the right stage. Number two is, um, I think, something that a lot of people don't consider, and I didn't until I experienced firsthand the problem of not doing this. That is allowing your flowers to rest and recover after you have cut them. Think about it, friends. You literally have just cut their throats. I mean, that's just not a nice way to say it. But it's true. You have just cut their lifeline. To think that you're going to cut flowers, take them inside, make an arrangement, and go deliver it. Um, Oftentimes, in the delivery mode of that, the flowers start to wilt. 
they will probably recover if you've given them the right circumstances. But the best case scenario for us is that we cut this morning, then the flowers are left indoors in their prime conditions, meaning maybe in a cooler, at least in an air-conditioned room, um, out of the wind, and they just are left to sit in the solution of their choice, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, to recover. What we always love to do is to cut on one day, and then the next morning you start packing buckets, doing orders, making bouquets, or whatever it is you have to do. People think for the freshest flowers you should cut them and run to market. That, in fact, is not the best case scenario. The best case is when we were doing farmer's markets, we cut on Thursday, made bouquets on Friday, and went to market on Saturdays, and our flowers were stellar and lasting. Um, So you have to allow that time. So number three is what's in the water, and I'm going to kind of cover for each, not each, but I'm going to talk about different scenarios for that. What people, as a general rule, what folks don't understand is that when flowers are drinking water, they really benefit from different, from flower food. We think that that's not true because of this scenario. This is what has um, kind of muddied the waters for flower conditioning products. That's what we call everything from pre-treatments to flower food. And there's several different products and and hydrators. Um, There's several different products in there. And this is why we think they don't work. So in the retail, I call it the retail cycle. Those are flowers that have gone, when I call flowers, flowers that have gone through the retail cycle, I'm talking about flowers that typically are harvested in South America, Ecuador, Colombia, wherever. They are cut Um, put in boxes, um, shipped via airplane, flown into Miami um, in a big 747. They are oftentimes treated upon arrival with fumigation for pests and diseases sometimes. And then they are then auctioned and sold and um, sent to a wholesaler or to a bouquet making company. Um, and then the wholesaler then turns around and ships it to florist. All of that process, which is a deep story in itself, right? Um, I mean, anybody that has a deep interest in knowing about where our flowers come from or 80% of the flowers that we use come from, I highly recommend Amy Stewart's book, Flower Confidential. It is really, really um, an amazing story to follow along. Anyway, What I am saying to you is that flowers that have gone through the retail cycle of which I have just described have been, are really old by the time we get them, typically seven to 10 days old, and they have been dry most of that time. Um, Those flowers are flowers that have been bred to sustain life without water for a long period of time, without drooping. Have you ever gotten roses that their heads are down. Well, roses typically don't tolerate not having water and their stems get clogged. Um, And so these flowers that we get are bred primarily to go through life without water, without drooping. So we get them. They still look pretty, right? They have flower food attached to the bouquet. We bring them home from the supermarket or wherever we bought them. We bring them home, we put that flower food in the water, and the flowers last five to seven days. Well, the next time we happen to buy that bunch of flowers from a supermarket or wherever, we're not talking local flowers, y'all. We're talking about those imported. The next time we buy that bunch, there's no flower food attached, right? We take them home, and guess what? They last about the same amount of time, five to seven days. And we think that darn flower food doesn't even work. Well, friends, here's the dirty little secret. Those stems of flowers are so clogged from being in a dry situation for so long that they aren't drinking water. But those are varieties of flowers that can go without a minimal to no amount of water. Our garden flowers are 100% the opposite of that. 
our garden flowers typically never go dry. Their stems are not clogged. Um, when we use those products, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute, and our flowers drink it, those flowers last so much longer if you want them to. And that's the other choice. Um, and I will talk about that. If you're a home gardener, you might not want your flowers to last 10 to 14 days. But a flower farmer, heck yes, you do, because it takes time for you to get your flowers to the end user. And all the steps make a difference. So it is our experience with retailed flowers that make us think the products don't work. But I am here to tell you after Two decades of spending a lot of additional expense on flower conditioning products, there's a reason that I do it. And it's because when you go about it in the right way, they definitely have an impact on the life of your flowers. All right, so we're going to talk about what's in the water here in just a moment. Um, so the next most important step for me is a clean container. Y'all, I'm talking about the container that you harvest into to the container that the flowers eventually end up in, meaning a vase. I can, I could tell you stories about nasty containers that were brought to our farm here to pick up flowers. And people just don't know, y'all. That is where, as a flower farmer, this is your job to educate people. Um, so some, I'm not talking about dirty containers as in dirt is in them. I'm talking about scummy buckets, and the scum is a result of water just sitting in the bucket. It gets dumped out, and then it never gets washed. Um, that scum is the breeding ground for bacteria. Bacteria is the death of flowers. That's what starts the process of short vase life, and by having a clean container, that means that you've added a couple of days of life to your flowers. So, and I get these questions often, um, because we, um, we have a bucket washing station on our farm, um, and here's what I tell people. If you're not willing to drink water out of the container that you're harvesting into or getting ready to put your flowers into, you shouldn't be putting flowers into it because it fuel a scummy container, which you can't really see. Um, it's like the ring around your bathtub. It's that kind of thing. If you... Um, are putting flat water into that kind of container, you have almost bacteria instantly before you've even done the next step. By having a clean container and putting water in it, step one is already bacteria free, right? So we wash buckets on our farm um, like we like we do glasses in that we're going to drink out of. And so first step one is if you do have scummy buckets, then yes, I would recommend that you use some type of bleach product, um, Clorox or whatever, to wash that first time. Um, we put a, about an inch or two of water in those types of containers, put a, a, a little dash of bleach and let it sit for 15 minutes. I do that. Um, I put a, a dash of bleach in all the containers, then I put a couple inches of water, and then I start washing them. We do not allow them to sit anywhere where a bird or a bug or a kid or a dog or a cat might drink out of it. They're never left unattended. Um, letting them sit for 10 or 15 minutes makes it a lot easier. Then we just wash our buckets in regular dishwashing liquid. After that initial cleanup, that is what we do each week. We just wash in soapy dish water, um, rinse, and then allow our buckets to dry um, by staging and stacking them. Um, and we also recommend putting vases and flower frogs in the dishwasher. Um, that's the easiest thing to do. Um, and so clean containers buys you, yet again, friends, one or two days of extra vase life. So that is the four that everybody should follow those practices. So let's talk about if you're a home gardener. If you're a home gardener, um, you can pick and choose what you want to do because you know what your, your method may be, you know what, I don't want my flowers to last but a week. You know, I have more flowers to pick. And there is nothing wrong, y'all, with bringing in a beautiful bouquet, having it for four or five days, and then throwing it on the compost heap because guess what? 
you have more flowers. That is a personal choice. Um, and you will have to go through that um, and figure that out for yourself. So you could just go with water <laughs> in your vase and in your harvest bucket. Um, and there are some flowers that will benefit from a hydrator if they're um, limp. And I'll talk about that down in the flower farmer stage, um, like hydrangeas, especially if you harvest at the wrong time. Um, and I didn't talk about that. We should go back. Let's make that number five. Harvesting at the best time of the day for your flowers also increases their vase life. Um, I, the preference for me is always early in the morning, but what after the dew is dried for most flowers, but not all of them necessarily. And um, that way, as they go through the day, they get exhausted and the carbohydrates and the flowers get used up. And then at night, they regain those. So cutting them in the morning has benefits. There are some flowers that are, are said to have more benefits to do in the evening. But as a general rule, cutting in the morning um, is the best time um, to prevent wilting problems. So as a home gardener, back to home gardeners, y'all, um, Go for water if you want to. Don't use anything. Um, but you just have to know that there are choices. So as you can, a, a home gardener could incorporate any of these steps that I'm going to share as flower farmers go, um, depending on what your end result is. So for flower farmers, um, you know, we want our flowers to last as long as possible. So let's just say you're cutting for florist. You know, you're cutting today, delivering tomorrow. The florist is going to sit on that flower for two or three days at least most often before it gets to the end user. The end user is the person enjoying it in their house. And you want that person to be the one to experience opening buds and long life of the beautiful arrangement, right? So, as a flower farmer, you know, after you have followed all of these steps, um, these are all general rules, y'all. There are exceptions to every rule, but we can't address every rule. We're talking general. For us as flower farmers, we put a CVBN tablet in every harvest bucket. The CVBN tablet is the chlorine tablet that... Um, when you put it into a clean bucket with clean water, you drop that tablet in. That means there is no bacteria present. And when you drop that newly harvested flower into that water, it fills instantly with bacteria-free water. And it continues to kill bacteria as the flower dumps organic matter into the water that can fuel um, bacteria to grow, right? Um, so we put a CVBN tablet in all buckets. Now, yes, there are some flowers that wouldn't necessarily require it or greatly benefit. I'll give you one example. Lysianthus just does not dirty the water at all. Lysianthus is like that perfect little house guest. Um, and, you know, it doesn't require it. And if we're doing a really big Lizzie harvest, we might not put CVB in tablets. But for me as a small market farmer, we make all of our buckets up at once. The CVB in tablets and the big picture are a inexpensive expense for us. And we just put a tablet into every bucket for the ease of craziness here on the farm. So every bucket gets that CVB in tablet. Now, um, and you can go to the product pages on the um, gardenersworkshop.com and read the details about all of this, about all the different products that we have. Um, and it tells you this, the CVBN tablet water, the flowers need to sit in that for at least four hours to gain benefit, but that it can sit there for up to 72 hours, which is three days, right? So that means there is no rush. I mean, it's really perfect. Like back in the days when we were harvesting in the morning and then doing a, a bouquet subscription delivery in late afternoon on that same day, those flowers sat in the water all morning into early afternoon. Then Suzanne would whip them into bouquets and I would be delivering them at three to four o'clock that afternoon. You can do that, but you can also leave them sitting overnight 
for bunching and packing for the next day. Um, so that is how that works for a flower, a floor, I'm sorry, delivering or whatever you're going to do with the flowers the next day. If you are a home gardener and you do want your flowers to last the longest, um, you need to let them sit for four hours up to 72 hours. And then you take them out of the water and make bouquets or do whatever you're going to do with them, right? So as a flower farmer that, let's just say you're delivering to florist. So this is the scenario. You would do what I just said. You'd harvest into CVB. Let them sit for at least four hours, but it can sit for up to three days. Um, then you start making your bunches after four hours, um, and you can do one of two things. If you pack your florist orders into your buckets that you take to them and then dump your water into their containers, which is what I did for years until I started requesting from my florist, give me your Percona boxes. Those are those square plastic boxes. And I will bring your next week's order in those containers that I will be sure they're clean, filled with holding solution. And you literally walk in the back door, drop your buckets, give them their invoice, and you're out of there. Um, so whether you're packing your buckets that you're going to dump into theirs or you're packing their containers, both of them would be clean, correct? We would then um, make our bunches, we'd fill those containers with fresh water, and we would drop a holding tea bag into that container. Tea bag is the method that the holding solution is delivered. It's just like a tea bag, like we put in our tea. You just drop it in and you leave it there, and it um, distributes the product that's in there. I love, and tea bag, the holding solution does come as a powder that you can scoop or a liquid. I love the tea bags because they're pre-measured. All you have to do is be sure you're putting the proper amount of water in the bucket, which we use a measuring stick that we've made. Um, and you just drop the tea bag in. And that does a couple of things. The tea bag is visual that everybody on your team can look in there and say, oh yeah, the tea bags are already in there. But better than that, the tea bags are labeled. So when your customer gets that water, they look in and say, oh, look, they really are pros. They're using the holding solution. It's amazing, y'all. What is holding solution? Holding solution is similar to flower food that the end user uses, except it is short on flower food, the nutrition part, because when you're in this stage, you don't want your flowers to continue to develop. You want them to hold, right? So, you, it has some nutrition. It continues what the um, chlorine does. It's a different product. It's a biocide, um, and it has a pH balancer, which keeps the stems open and drinking. Um, so if you're a flower farmer delivering to florist, you harvest into the, um, the, the um, chlorine tablets, CVBN tablets, then you move it to holding solution when you're taking them to your florist, and you give that holding solution water to your florist. That's the end of your conditioning. That was primarily all of our steps for our commercial customers, okay? Now, let's talk about if you are delivering to supermarkets, bouquets that you're dropping off at supermarkets. We do the very same process, except we use the smaller size tea bag, which is the half gallon size, and we harvest, they sit overnight, we make the bouquets the next day, we prepare those black supermarket bouquet um, buckets, which we're going to leave at the supermarket, and we put a half a gallon of water in there, we drop in a holding solution tea bag, when we make our bouquets, they're popped in there, and that's what's dropped at the supermarket, okay? So that's what supermarkets do. Now, if I'm going to the farmer's market, on Saturday, which I'm going to call this short-term display buckets. Um, I We never really worried about holding solution. If your flowers are being made into bouquets and you're taking them to the farmer's market in the morning, um, I mean, yes, you can use holding solution, 
but we just really didn't find it necessary at that point. If the flowers were just harvested a day or so before, we just really didn't find that necessary. Um, so we went from the CVBN tablets to making the bouquets and dropping them into black buckets, which is what we used at the farmer's market the next day with just straight water. Now, that means they're not sitting in that bucket for day after day after day. So that's what we would do for farmer's markets. Now let's talk about farm stands or like our members only market, which oftentimes the flowers would be sitting for more than a day. Um, then we would use holding solution in those buckets. It keeps stuff from growing. It keeps the flowers healthy and happy. And then you know, we don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, we need to change that water um, because I'll just go down a rabbit hole. Remember that Lizzianthus that I said, maybe you're not going to put CVB in. Um, if you put Lizzie's or maybe even peonies in the cooler with just water, with nothing in there to keep stuff from growing, you have to change the water every day or two. Funky stuff grows fast. So keep that in mind. Um, so all of the end users, this means you home gardener, this means farmer's market um, customers, this means the supermarket customers, all of them should be getting to use the largest size flower food packet to put into their vase, their clean vase, when they get home, y'all. That continues the rest of the story. And I want to just tell you there are two different types of flower food that we use. We use just regular fresh cut flower food. That is for any bouquet. But if you want to ramp your game up, there is what is called, and we've used it for years, especially back when we grew a lot of dahlias and grew a lot of daffs um, and tulips. I mean, we're talking a long time ago. Um, there is bulb Cut flower, cut flower food. What that means is that if you have flowers that were grown from a bulb, like dahlias, like tuberoses, like daffodils, that bulb fresh flower food has an additional hormone in it that helps the bulb grown flowers, the foliage stay greener, and for them to continue to develop more. They just have a little bit different need. If you have a mixed bouquet that includes one bulb stem, you can use bulb fresh flower food. You know, I mean, bulb fresh flower food does not harm or deplete all the other cut flowers. Um, so that is um, just an additional service. So friends, I am here to tell you, that doing all of those steps will give you stellar vase life. If you're a flower farmer, um, that should be your goal, is to provide that end user, whether you're the one selling to that end user or not. That should be your ultimate goal. If you're selling to florists, if you're selling to supermarkets, if you're selling to wholesalers, for sure. Um, it is our job to, con to cut at the right stage, to allow our flowers to rest, to be sure the proper solution is in the bucket, that we have clean containers, and that we're harvesting at the right time so that when it gets to the end user, they realize that locally grown flowers are not only varieties they can't get anywhere else. They're not only fragrant and absolutely gorgeous, but they last longer. So they are a value to our end customers. This is how we are going to wind florist and supermarkets to be drawn to locally grown flowers, friends. It is a fact. It is a fact. So friends, I know as soon as I end this, I'm going to realize I've left something out. That's why I talk about the same subjects over and over. We all learn in different ways, and I hope that I'm recording this in mid-May. We are in the midst of spring on the verge of warm season flowers for many of us, and we just have to constantly tweak um, our our steps to what the season is and, um, you know, 
I would love it if you would share this with your friends. The more of us that condition our flowers properly and cut at the right stage makes all of us better, y'all. All of us better. So if you're enjoying my podcast here at the Field and Garden, you just don't know how much it means to me for you to post a review. I know it's a pain. I know it is. I just did some reviews for things um, for folks because I know how important it is in reaching more people. Um, and But I just took a moment and did it. And I just appreciate each and every review and I read them all. What it does is it makes the podcast know, hey, people are liking that podcast. We need to show it to more people. That's the bottom line. Whether it's a review on Amazon for a book on my website for a product. It just helps other people to know that maybe they should, you know, try that or do that. And um, friends, I just really appreciate it. And again, if you um, want to learn more about what I'm doing, um, what drives me and all of those that I have chosen to work with us, um, the TGW crew is amazing. We have built a um, a board of um just amazing instructors that are bringing course ideas um, to help other people build flower-based businesses and home gardeners to grow like a flower farmer, right? I mean, we just, we just love sharing the information with you guys. All right, folks, so we're going to call it a day and Thanks for joining me here, and it is your friend Lisa signing off. Until we meet again, friends, ciao.